Welcome to this CUBE Conversation with Fortinet. I'm your host, Lisa Martin. Derek Mankey is back. He's the Chief Security Insights and Global Threat Alliances at Fortinet's FortiGuard Labs. Derek, welcome back to the program. Hey Lisa, thanks for having me. It's great to speak with you. Likewise, we've talked a lot this year, and of course, when I saw that there are, uh, you guys have predictions from FortiGuard Labs Global Threat Intelligence and Research Team about the cyber threat landscape for 2022, I thought there's going to be a lot to talk about with Derek here. So let's go ahead and dig right in. First of all, one of the things that caught my attention was the title of the press release about the predictions that was just re uh, revealed. It, the press release says, FortiGuard Labs predicts cyber attacks aimed at everything from crypto wallets to satellite internet, nothing. There is no surface that is safe anymore. Talk to me about some of the key challenges that organizations in every industry are facing. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, uh, as you said, you, you hit the key word there, surface, right? That, and that attack, the surface is, is open for attack. That's the attack surface that we talk about. It is literally being pushed out from the edge to space. Like a lot of these places that had no connection before, particularly in OT environments, off grid, we're talking about, uh, you know, um, a critical infrastructure, oil and gas, as an example. There's a lot of these remote units that were living out there that relied on field engineers to go in and, and uh, you know, plug into them. They were air gapped. Those such those sort of the things now are going to be accessible by LEOs, low Earth orbital satellites, and there are four thousand of those out there right now. It's going to be over thirty thousand. We're talking Starlink. We're talking at least four or five other competitors entering this uh, space. No, no pun intended, and um, and that's a big deal because that it's a gateway. It opens the door for cyber criminals to be able to have accessibility to these networks, and so security has to come you know fr uh, front of mind there, right? It absolutely does. We've got this fragmented perimeter, tools that are siloed, the expand, very expanded attack service, as you just mentioned. But some of the other targets, the 5G enabled edge, the core network, of course, the home environment where many of us still are. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So that home environment, like the edge, it is a, uh, it's, it's the smart edge, right? So we have things called EATs, edge access trojans. These are Trojans that will actually impact and infect edge devices. And if you think about these edge devices, we're talking things that have machine learning and, and auto automation built into them, a lot of privilege, because they're actually processing commands and acting on those commands in a lot of cases, right? Everything from smart office, smart home, up in, even into the uh, OT environment that we're talking about. And that is uh, a juicy uh, target for attackers, right? Because these uh, devices naturally have more privilege. They have APIs and connectivity to a lot of these things where they can definitely do some serious damage and be used as these pivot points within the network from the edge, right? And, and, that's, and that's a key point there. Let's talk about the digital wallet that we all walk around with. You know, we think, oh, it's so easy. We can do quick, simple transactions with Apple Wallet, Google Smart Tap, Venmo, what have you. But that's another growing source of that where we need to be concerned, right? Yeah, so I, I, I've, I've worn my cybersecurity hat for over 20 years and 10 years ago even, we were talking all about online banking Trojans. That was a big threat, right? Um, because a lot of financial institutions, they hadn't laid, ruled out things like multi-factor authentication. It was fairly easy to get someone's bank credentials, go in, siphon funds out of an account. That's a lot harder nowadays. And so cyber criminals are shifting tactics to go after the low hanging fruit, which are these digital wallets and often cryptocurrency, right? We've actually seen this already in FortiGuard Labs. Some of this is already starting to happen right now. I expect uh, uh, this to happen a lot more in 2022 and beyond. And it's because, you know, these wallets are um, hold a lot, of, a lot of value right now, right? With the crypto and they can be transferred easily without having to do, elect, you know, EFTs and wire transfers and all those sorts of things that includes actually a lot of paperwork from the financial institutions. And, you know, we saw something where they were actually hijacking these wallets, right? Just intercepting a copy and paste command because it, it takes, you know, it's a 54 character address. People aren't typing that in all the time. So when they're sending or receiving funds, they're actually, what we've actually seen in malware today is they're taking that, intercepting it and replacing it with the attacker's wallet. Simple as that, bypassing all the, you know, authentication measures and so forth. And is that happening for the rest of us that don't have crypto wallets? Is that happening for folks with Apple wallets? And is that a growing threat yeah. concern that people need to be, it is. Absolutely, yeah. So crypto wallets is, is the majority of what we're seeing, but yeah, no no digital wallet is, is untouched here. Absolutely, these are all um, valid targets and we are starting to see activity in that, yeah. I'm sure going after those stored credentials, that's probably low hanging fruit for the attackers. Absolutely, yeah. Another thing that was interesting that the 2022 predictions threat landscape 
highlighted was the esports industry and the vulnerabilities there. Talk to me about that. That was something that I found surprising. I didn't realize it was a billion dollar revenue a year industry. A lot of money there. A lot of money, a lot of money. And these are our full blown platforms that have been developed. This is a business. This isn't, you know, again, going back to what we've seen and we still do see the online gaming itself. We've seen Trojans written for that. Oftentimes it's just trying to get into end users gaming accounts so that they can steal virtual equipment and current, you know, there, there's virtual currencies as well. So there was some monetization happening, but not on a grand scale. This is about a shift of tactics going after a business, just like any organization, big business, right? To be able to hold it uh, hostage effectively in terms of DDoS threats, in terms of new vulnerabilities, in terms of also, um, you know, crippling these systems with ransomware, like we've already seen starting to hit OT. This is just another big target, right? Um, and if you think about it, these are live platforms that rely on low latency, so very quick connections. Anything that interrupts that, Think about the Olympics, right? In the sports environment, it's a big deal to them. And it's a lot of revenue that could be lost when cyber criminals fully realize this. And this is why you know, we're predicting that esports is going to be a, um, a big target for them moving forward. Got it. And let's talk about what's going on with ransomware. When you and I spoke a few months ago, I think it was ransomware was up nearly 11x in the first half of uh, calendar year 2021. What are you seeing from an evolution perspective uh, in the actual ransomware um, actions themselves, as well as what the what the cyber criminals are evolving to? Yeah, so two words, um, aggressive, destructive, <laughs> not good words, right? But, but this is what we're seeing with ransomware now. Again, they're not just going after data as the currency. We're seeing um, destructive capabilities put into ransomware, including wiper malware. So this used to be just in the realm of uh, APTs, nation state attacks. We saw that with Shamoon, we saw that with Dark Soul back in 2013. So dest destructive threats, but in the world of APT and, and nation state, now we're seeing this in cybercrime, we're seeing it with ransomware. And this I expect to be a, a full blown tactic for cyber criminals simply because they have the, the threat, right? Um, they've already leveraged a lot of extortion and double extortion schemes. We've talked about that. Now they're going to be onboarding this as a new threat, basically um, planting these time bombs, these ticking time bombs, holding systems for, for, for ransom saying, and cri probably crippling a couple to show that they mean business and saying, unless you pay us within a day or two, we're going to take all these systems offline. We're not just going to take them offline. We're going to destroy them. Right. And that's a big incentive for people to, to, to pay up. So they're really playing on that fear element. That's what I mean about aggressive. Right. They're going to be really shifting tactics there. Aggressive and destructive are two things you don't want in, an, in a cybersecurity environment or to be called by your employer. Just wanted to point that out. <laughs> Talk to me a minute about wiper malware. Is this new emerging or is this something that's seeing a resurgence? Because this came up at the Olympics in the summer, yeah, right? Absolutely. So a resurgence in in a sort of different way, right? So as I said, we have seen it before, but it's been not too prevalent. It's been very, uh, it's it's been a niche area for them, right? Specifically for these very highly targeted attacks. So yes, the Olympics. In fact, two times in the Olympics in Tokyo, but also uh, in the last Summer Olympics as well. We also saw it with, as I mentioned, in uh, South Korea and Dark Soul in 2013. We saw it in an OT environment with Shamoon as an example, but we're talking handfuls here. Uh, unfortunately, we have blogged about three of these in the last month, the month and a half, right? And, the, and you know, this is starting to be married with ransomware, which is particularly very dangerous because it's not just wiper malware, but couple that with the ransom tactics. And that's what we're starting to see is this new, it's resurgent, yes, but a completely new form that's taking place. Um, even to the point, I think, in the future that uh, it could it could severely, like right now what we're seeing is it's not too critical in a sense that it's it's not completely destroying the system. You can recover the system still. We're talking master boot records, those sorts of things. But in the future, I think they're going to be going after the form, firmware themselves, essentially turning some of these devices into paperweights. And that's going to be a, a very big problem. Wow, that's a very scary thought, that getting to the firmware and turning those devices into paperweights. One of the things also that the report talked about that, that was really interesting was that more attacks against the supply chain and Linux particularly. Talk to us about that. What did you find there? What does it mean? What's the threat for organizations? Yeah, so we're seeing uh, diversification in terms of the platforms that cyber criminals are going after. Again, it's that attack surface. Um, 
lower hanging fruit in a sense, uh, because they've, it, you know, for a fully patched versions of Windows 10, Windows 11, it's harder, right, for cyber criminals than it was five or 10 years ago to get into those systems. If we look at the, uh, just the prevalence, the amount of devices that are out there in IoT and OT environments, these are running on Linux, a lot of different flavors and forms of Linux. Therefore, there's different security holes that come up with that. And that's that, that's a big patch management issue as an example too. And so this is what we, you know, we've already seen it with the Mirai botnet, but this is in our threat landscape report. Mirai was the number one threat that we saw. That's a Linux based botnet. Now uh, Microsoft has rolled out something called WSL, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux in Windows 10 and Windows 11, meaning that Windows supports Linux now. So that all the code that's being written for botnets, for malware, all that stuff is able to run on, on new Windows platforms effectively. So this is how they're trying to expand their uh, attack surface. And um, that ultimately gets into the supply chain because again, a lot of these devices in manufacturing and operational technology environments rely um, quite heavily actually on Linux. Well, and with all the supply chain issues that we've been facing during the pandemic, how can organizations protect themselves against this? Yeah, so this, this is a, a big thing, right? And we talked about also the weaponization of artificial intelligence, automation, all of these. There's a lot going on, as you know, right? From the threats, a lot to get visibility on, a lot to be able to act quickly on. And that's a big key metric there is how quick you can detect these and respond to them. For that, you need good threat intelligence, of course, but you also truly need to enable uh, uh, automation, things like SD-WAN, uh, uh, a mesh architecture as well, uh, having a security fabric that can actually integrate devices that talk to each other and can detect these threats and respond to them quickly. That's a very important piece because if you don't stop these attacks while they're in that movement through the uh, attack chain, so the, the kill chain concept we talk about, um, the risk is very high nowadays. We're, um, you know everything we just talked about from ransomware and destructive capabilities. So having those approaches is very important. Also having um, ed, you know, education and a workforce trained up is, is equally as important too, to be, you know, um, uh, to, to be aware of these threats. I'm glad you brought up that education piece and the training. I know that's something that Fortinet is very dedicated to doing, but it also brings up the cybersecurity skills gap. I know I, when I talked with Kenzie uh, just a couple months ago at the um, PGA tournament, he was talking about you know big investments in what Forty Guard Forty Fortinet is doing to help reduce that gap, but the gap is still there. How do IT teams not get overloaded with the expanding surface? It seems like the service, the surface is just there is no limit anymore. So how do how do IT teams that are lean and small help themselves in the fact that the threat is landscape is is expanding? The criminals are getting smarter. They're using AI, intelligent automation. What do IT teams do? Fight fire with fire. You, you got to use two, the same tools that they're using on their side. You need to be able to use in your toolkit. We're talking about a security operations center perspective to have tools like, again, this comes to the threat intelligence to get visibility on these things. We're talking SIM and SOAR. Uh, we have you know 40 AI out now, um, deception products, all these sorts of things. These are all tools that need that, that uh, can help um, those the people so you don't have to have a you know uh, hire 40 or 50 people in your sock right it's more about how you can work together with the tools and technology to have escalation paths to do more people process procedure as we talk about to be able to educate and train on those to be able to have incident response planning so what do you do when because inevitably you're going to be targeted probably in a ransomware attack what do you do um, playing out those scenarios, doing breach and attack simulation, all of those things, that comes down to the, the skills gap still. It's a lot about that education and awareness, not having to do the, the stuff that can be handled by automation and AI. And, and training, is, you're absolutely right. We've dedicated a lot with our NSC program at Fortinet. We also have our Fortinet Security Academy, uh, you know, where we're integrating with post-secondary so we can ha have the skill sets ready uh, for, for new graduates, as an example, there's a lot of progress being made towards that. We've even created a new Powered by FortiGuard Labs. There is a FortiGuard Labs play in our NSC 7, as an example, which, uh, you know, for um, uh, threat hunting and offensive security, as an example, understanding really how attackers are, are you know, launching their, their campaigns and um, all of those things come together. But that, that's the good news, actually is that we've come a long way. We actually did our first machine learning and AI models over 10 years ago. So this isn't something new to us. So the technology has gone a long way. It's just a matter of how 
um, we can collaborate and, and obviously integrate with that for the uh, the skills gap. And, and I, one more question on the actual threat landscape. Were there any industries that came up in particular as we talked about esports, we talked about OT, but any industries that came up in particular as, as really big hotspots that companies and, and organizations really need to be aware of? Yeah, so also uh, this is part of OT, but ICS, critical infrastructure, that's a big one. Uh, absolutely. There, we're seeing a, a also cyber criminals offering more crime services now on dark web. So CAAS, which is crime as a service, because it used to be, a, again, a very specialized area that maybe only a handful of organized criminal organizations could actually um, you know, launch attacks and, and impact those targets. So they're going after those targets. Now they're offering services, right, uh, to other up and coming cyber criminals to be able to try to monetize that as well. Again, we're seeing this, we, we actually call it advanced persistent cybercrime, APC, instead of an APT, because they're starting to take cybercrime to these targets like ICS, critical infrastructure, um, healthcare as well is another one, again, usually in the realm of APT, but now being targeted more by cyber criminals and, and uh, ransomware. I've heard of ransomware as a service. Is that a subcategory of crime as a service? Absolutely, yep. Uh, it is phishing as a service, ransomware as a service, DDoS as a service, botnet as a service, many of these subcategories. Uh, but uh, ransomware as a service, that's uh, another big problem as well, because this is an affiliate model, right, where they hire partners and pay them commission uh, if they actually uh, get payments of ransom, right? So they have uh, literally a middle layer in this network that they're pushing out to, to scale their attacks. You know, and I think that's the last time we talked about ransomware. We talked about it's a matter of, and I talk to customers all the time who say, yes, it's a matter of when, not if, is is this the same sentiment you think for crime as a service in general, the attacks on esports, on home networks, on uh, internet satellites in space? Is this just a matter of when, not if, across the board? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, but the good news is it doesn't have to be, a, you know, when it happens, it doesn't have to be a catastrophic situation. Again, that's the whole point about preparedness and planning and all the things I talked about, the filling the skills gap in education and having the proper, proper tools in place. That all mitigates that risk, right? And, and, that's, and that's perfectly acceptable. And that's the way we should handle this from the industry because um, we, we process, we've talked about this before, over 100 billion threats a day in FortiGuard Labs. The volume is just going to continue to grow. It's very noisy out there. There's a lot of automated threats, a lot of attempts knocking on uh, organizations' doors and networks and you know, um, phishing emails being sent out and all that. So it's something that we just need to be prepared for, just like you do for uh, natural disaster planning and all, all these sorts of other things in the physical world. That's a good point. It doesn't have to be aggressive and destructive. But last question for you, how can how is FortiGuard helping companies in every industry get aggressive and destructive against the threats? Yeah, great, great, great question. So this is something I'm, I'm very passionate about. Uh, as you know, uh, we're, you know, we, we don't stop just with customer protection. Of course, that is as a security vendor, that's our, 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 our primary and foremost objective is to protect and mitigate risk to the customers. That's how we're doing, you know, this is why we have 24 seven, 365 operations at 40 Guard Labs and we're helping to, to find the latest and greatest on threat intelligence and hunting, but we don't stop there. We're actually working in the industry. Um, so we mentioned this before the Cyber Threat Alliance to, to collaborate and share intelligence on threats all the way down to disrupt cybercrime. This is a big target of ours, is how we can work together to disrupt cybercrime. Because unfortunately, they've made a lot of money, a lot of profits, and we need to reduce that. We need to send a message back and fight that aggressiveness. And we're we're on it, right? So we're working with uh, Interpol, a Project Gateway, with the World Economic Forum, the Partnership Against Cybercrime. It's a lot of initiatives with other, uh, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the who's who of cybersecurity in the industry to work together and tackle this collaboratively. Um, the good news is there's been some steps of success to that. There's a lot more we're doing to scale up the efforts. Excellent. Well, Derek, as always, great and very informative conversation with you. I always look forward to these, seeing what's going on with the threat landscape, the challenges, the increasing challenges, but also the good news, the opportunities in it and what FortiGuard is doing. Forty Lab, Forty Net, excuse me, I can't speak today, to help customers address that. And uh, we always appreciate your insights and your time. We look forward to talking to you and unveiling the next predictions in 2022. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Lisa. My pleasure. For Derek Mankey, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching this CUBE Conversation with Fortinet. Thanks for watching.